for this evening's service and I can only say I hope your afternoon was as good as mine and uh, we're back together again to have this evening's service to have a opportunity again to praise the Lord and also to hear from his word so uh, let's just open in a, in a word of prayer Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for this day that you've um, given us, the opportunity you've given us to um, be able to meet together again. Uh, Lord, we are thankful that um, we live in a country where we're freely allowed to do this and we acknowledge that it's not the case everywhere. And uh, Father, we're just uh, thankful for where, you, for where you've placed us, um, where you've placed us in this uh, local assembly. And Father, we just ask now as we gather together that uh, Father, you'd um, would f be fit to dwell with us, and um, as we sing these hymns and praises, that they would arise just as a sweet savour. And uh, as we Pastor lay, later opens the word, that uh, we'd have an attentive heart and. We just ask these things through your son's precious name. Amen. Welcome to church this evening. If you can all stand with me, we're going to sing My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. We'll sing the first, the third, and the fourth verses tonight. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or greed. I trust the ever-living one whose words for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. You may be seated. The next one we're going to sing tonight is Constantly Abiding. We'll sing all three verses of this one. that has come here to stay. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers of so Jesus, the glorious Thou art. Constantly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so Oh, Lord. 
Good evening, everyone. Isn't that a comfort to sing that Jesus will never leave us and we can look forward to an eternity with him? All right. Well, it's time now for the memory verse and just do as we normally do. So I'll say the reference, you say the reference, and then we'll go through it twice. And the second time, I'm pretty sure there'll be words missing up there. All right, let's go. Psalm 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Upon them that hope in his mercy. And again, behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to that. If you could all stand with me one more time before the message, we're going to sing I Know Whom I Have Believed. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth verses tonight. Take your Bibles, Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, we finally got to verse 5. So we're in Titus chapter 1, we'll be in verses 5 to verse 9 for some time, we'll see how long we'll be there, but Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to verse 9. It says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things which are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, uh, for a bishop must be blameless, as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angered, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful words as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, I will say, looking at a passage like this, um, it gives, this is one of the passages that gives the qualifications 
of an elder, of a bishop, of a pastor, of a ruler, whatever you want to call the person um, that is the under-shepherd of a church. And looking at these and studying them out is always a convicting thing. Um, but let me just say, before you say, well, I'm not any one of those, so therefore I can shut off and I really don't have to worry about this. Let me just say, this list of character traits and character qualities is good for anyone who follows Christ. It's not just for a pastor. It's not just for an elder. It's not just for a bishop. It's not just for a ruler. If everyone followed these, wouldn't it be a good thing? Wouldn't the church have a good testimony? Wouldn't we be able to make an impact uh, for Christ? And so we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at this idea. Now, um, if you remember in the last couple of weeks, last, I think, two or three weeks that we've had uh, the messages on Titus, we learned five marks of a healthy church, and we learned that a healthy church is full of individuals who are passionate about people coming to faith in Christ and are willing to do anything short of sin to share the gospel with people. We also learned that a healthy church is full of people who are on a faith journey. For the ones that claim Christ as Savior, they are always growing, always changing. We learned the third mark is a healthy church is full of people who want to make a difference in life, but also realize this life is just a beginning part to eternity. Uh, their hope is in heaven and nowhere else. We learned that a healthy church is full of people that understand that the preaching of the gospel is the most important thing we do as a church. Yes, it is. I mean, we do a lot of other things as a church, right? But the most important church is, the most important thing is the preaching of the gospel. And by the way, the preaching of the gospel doesn't just play, take place from behind a podium. The preaching of the gospel takes place in everyday life when, you, when you're sharing the gospel. And we learn uh, the fifth thing is a healthy church is full of people who are disciples of Jesus who make other disciples of Jesus. It's not an option. It's a command. And so now we're going to be looking at this and we're going to be uh, looking at this idea that leadership matters. I remember uh, when I was in Bible college and I was getting my master's degree, we took a class called uh, Leadership in a Local Church. And I remember sitting there and they brought in every so many weeks, Pastor Sexton would bring in a man by the name of Dr. Lee Robertson. And at that time, he was in his 90s. As a matter of fact, I believe he preached all the way up until he was 97. And he would just sit in class and, uh, with us when he was there, and he would just look at us and say, all right, gentlemen, what questions do you have? And we could just ask him questions constantly. And uh, the questions we would ask him, he'd answer, and they were always very practical, but he was always known for saying this, everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything. And so as we look at this, we're going to be looking at what Paul has left Titus in Crete to do. What did he send them to do? Well, first of all, we see the mission in verse 5. He says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things which are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Now, do you ever wonder, he said elders, plural, in every city, plural. Yes? And cities are meaning more than, you know, there's more, not just one location. Every city, meaning like not just one, but everyone, yes? We're talking about the island of Crete. Did you ever wonder, how did all these cities end up with believers, with bodies of Christ that needed to be set in order and reminded of things? You know what's fun to do sometime? Look up words in the Bible. And see where they're first mentioned. And see where they connect. Because you know the Bible connects a lot. So if you would, take your Bible. I believe as I was studying out Crete and I looked up Crete in the Bible. That's a weird word to look up. But I looked up Crete. And guess where I found it? Go back to Acts chapter 2. We all know what happened in Acts chapter 2, right? Peter preached the gospel... And the great multitude of people that were there from all over the world heard the gospel in their own tongue, yes? Guess who was present under the preaching of Peter who heard the gospel in their own tongue and accepted Christ as their Savior there in Jerusalem? Can you guess? Look with me 
at verse 11. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God. So where did these Cretans, who are known as liars and, and beasts and, and all sorts of evil things, first hear the gospel or hear the gospel and bring it back to Crete? Over in Acts chapter 2. When Peter preached the gospel. And so now, when Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, he was traveling there, and he was, he was near there, and he heard about all these bodies of believers in Crete. But he heard that all these bodies of believers had some issues. So what did he do? He said, hey, Titus, my troubleshooter. Right? Titus, the one that goes to places where no one else wants to go. I got an assignment for you. I want you to go to Crete, and I've got a mission uh, for you to do. And I want you to go and find all those people. By the way, if you had just heard the gospel in Acts chapter 2, and yes, I know, um, you know, they, they did all those things, and they went back to their island, and they formed kind of a loose collection of churches. And Paul visited them briefly on his way to Rome, and, um, and he goes to Titus and sends him there. But do you think if you just heard the gospel when Peter preached it, and what little bit of teaching you got while you are in Jerusalem... And then you got excited about what God did in your life, and you went home to your home city, and you began to teach people what you learned. Wouldn't there be some lacking things? Like when you first accepted Christ as your Savior, like say if you're here tonight and you know that Christ is your Savior, you've been saved any length of time. If you think back to when you first accepted Christ as your Savior, did you know half as much about the Bible as you know today? I hope the answer is no. Because if you've been saved in a length of time, the answer is, nope, I almost learned the same thing I know back then. You're not doing something right. You're not studying the Word of God. You should know a little bit more today than you did yesterday and on and on, right? So can you imagine when they got there and they shared the gospel with them, people got saved, then they began to ask them questions like, well, what do I do about this? I don't know. I just know Jesus saved me, and that's what, that's, you know, do you kind of get the idea now why Titus is being sent to set things in order? All right, so we, we, we see this mission, and he's given a, a mandate, and he's given a twofold mandate in verse 5, and, and that was to, to set in order the things that are wanting. That, that phrase, to set in order, means to set a, you know, have you ever, have you ever seen an x-ray of a broken bone? Have you ever seen someone set a broken bone? That's what that set in order means. That, that, <clears throat> I remember one time sitting in the emergency room with my wife, and she, there's many a time she hits her toe and says, I broke my toe, but this time I know for sure she did. All right? If you're in my house, anytime a lady that was in my house, whether it's my wife or any of my daughters, stub their toe, they'll immediately yell, Oh, I broke my toe! And they have some of the most broken toes in the world. But this time I knew it was real. You know why? You know how I knew it was real? The bone was sticking out of the toe. And I knew that was broken. Because bones don't stick out of skin. And so we're sitting there and the, and, and the person comes in and says, hey, What's wrong? I broke my toe. And how does one know we broke the toe? I said, The bone's sticking out. That's what my wife said. The bone's sticking out. And they said, Oh, let me see. And they looked down. There, oh, yes, it is. Well, that's observant. I don't, and no x-ray needed there, like it's coming out. And then they went and got someone else, and they came in after they did some looking at it and all those types of things. They said, they said, we have to set it now. And they gave her one of those special whistles. You know what I mean? They said, blow on the whistle a little bit, okay? So she was doing it and doing it and doing it. And then they said, okay, you're going to feel some pain. We're about to set it. And they grabbed a hold of that toe and yanked it and aligned the bone together and they set it back in order. And then they, you know, bandaged it and splinted it and did all that they could to it to protect it. And they said, all right, you're good. Take it easy. Don't put a lot of, you know, weight on that toe. 
uh, let it set and let it heal, and then come back in a few weeks and follow up with your GP, and they'll make sure that it's been set properly and healed properly and all those types of things. And, you know, there, there was that. That is what Paul was telling Timothy to do with these churches. There were some things in these groups of believers that were broken, that needed to be put right and to be set back in in order. Hey, they were a mess. But if we're all honest with with ourselves, isn't every church a little bit of a mess because we're a bunch of sinners? We all have our little things that we need you know, set in order. So don't get too down on them. And then he was, all after he set things in order, he was to appoint elders in every city. That was one of the things that Paul said was unfinished or, or needed to be corrected in these churches. He's concerned with the lack of leadership in these churches. And Paul writes to Titus that his main goal uh, is to create healthy churches and to appoint elders in every city. In every city, as I had appointed thee. By the way, I don't know if you know this or not. When Titus was sent to Crete, when he said appoint elders in every city, there were a hundred cities on Crete. A hundred. Small task, right? Right? He, had, he was supposed to appoint them in every city. Now, that, 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 was, a, that was an assignment to be given, right? That, that was a, a thing. Now, as we look at that, Paul's normal church planting practice went a little bit like this. Go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Now let's look at verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Jerusalem, which also they did and set it and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So do we see this idea that there was a common practice that when when Bar- when Saul, when Paul and his team or or Barnabas and Saul, even before Saul really went by Paul a lot, um, do we see a regular practice here that there was appointed elders when you get a church, right? Go then to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 and verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So what did they appoint in the church? Elders. Yes? Right? Go to chapter 15, verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed uh, Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So what do they do? They, they, the elders got together, and then they made a decision to send Paul and Barnabas, and, and this Barsabbas, or Judas, and Silas. I don't think so. The decision was made by the by the elders. So, what were there in the church? They were they were elders. Now we have to ask ourselves this question. Now, before we go into this more, what's an elder? Because we're not familiar. We don't use that term, do we? I'm sorry, but when I think of the term elder, I don't think of it in a good way. You're looking at me really funny. You say, "What do you think of?" I think of. The Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whatever, you, whatever they're calling themselves these days, these days. If you've ever talked to one of them, what does every one of their name badges say? Elder, elder, elder. So I think in response to a false gospel, in response to a 
a false Christian church, most Bible-believing Christians uh, go, you know what, I'm not going to use that term. Don't we? Have you ever been in a church that has an elder? With the word elder? Yeah. Brethren church, though, right? Not a Baptist church, okay. But do, do you see what I mean? Like, in our church, one person goes, yeah, I've been in a church with an elder. Right? We just don't use the term. We tend to shy away from it because of the way it's used in other places. We don't want to be identified by it. Now, here's the problem. Here's one thing I'm learning in life and learning and saying the word of God. Why should we shy away from a biblical term just because someone uses it improperly? Let's stop doing that. It's kind of like, you know, um, I remember one time I was, when we were, I think when we were back in the States in 2012, a pastor, I, we were, I was calling a church trying to see if we could present what, we were, what the Lord's called us to continue doing in Australia, and he asked me this question. Do you ever use the term from your preaching, baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I said, yes. I do. He said, we can't have you then. I said, why not? He said, that's charismatic Pentecostal term. I said, mm, last time I checked, baptism of the Holy Spirit is actually in the book. And when you accept Christ as your Savior, you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell the believer. Do you believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? I asked him. He said, I, he said, I sure do. But we don't ever use that term, or we don't want anyone to use that term, because it's too closely associated with Charismatics and Pentecostals. I began to scratch my head and go, so we ignore the Bible because someone uses it wrong? So let's not ignore the Bible because someone uses it wrong, okay? Let's, let's look at this. And I began to look at uh, definitions and began to try to study how do you define what an elder is? Well, someone once said, an elder is a spiritually mature man, knowledgeable in the scriptures, officially recognized by the local church to work with other elders and ex exercising oversight and shepherding of God's flock. All right? In the New Testament, there are two church offices that are tasked with leading a church. They are the elders and the deacons. We'll get into the deacons the next, whenever we get through this message, because that's next. But as we, as we begin to think of the, this, did you know there are four words in the New Testament that begin to give us a picture of what an elder is. Okay, so let's look at them, right? If there's four words, because there's four words used to describe the church office which I hold. And here's the funny thing. We tend to use the term that's only ever used once in the Bible. And we use it the most. What does everyone call? Well, Pastor Joe, right? Is that what people call me? Call me Joe, call me Trouble, call me Pastor Joe, Pastor Marshall, yeah. Whatever you call me, just don't call me, don't eat chocolate, okay? That's not going to work. But, you know, we use the one term that's used one time and not the other terms. That, so please, after this message, don't walk up, hey, Elder Marshall, hey, Elder Joe, okay? You know, I'm not, I'm not going there either, okay? I'm not asking for that either. I'm just saying um, it's interesting to me in studying this out that we tend to go to the term that's used once. Okay? Just take that for what it is. All right now, here are the four words. Elder. It's also the presbytos is the word that comes from. And that's where we get the word Presbyterian. Which I think also may be why Baptists stay away from that because we're not Presbyterian and, you know, it's a different denomination. There's differences there. But it's used as one who's an example of mature faith. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. And Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And so, you know, the, and, and when they were come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia and, 
after what manner I have been with you all seasons, he began to talk to them, and he began to give a charge to these leaders of the church in Ephesus. So when Paul calls the leaders of the church in Ephesus, who does he call? He calls the elders, all right? And he begins to talk to them. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. In verse 17, it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. All right? Double honor. Now, the only place I've ever seen that taken literally was in Mexico. Um, when, when we were in Mexico, when we were with my wife's father, the, the, not this church that he planted, but the church before that, um, Ortega Baptist Church, the average salary of their church members, now this, this will blow your mind, was $40 a week, 40 US dollars a week, and they worked 40 hours a week in a factory to get that. And if they were on time and did a good job, their bonuses was like a bag of rice and those type of things. And so when they called their pastor and they were to ordain their pastor, um, they said, well, if that's the standard salary in the church, $40 a week, then that's the starting point. And then someone said to my father-in-law, my father-in-law said, I don't know, I can't remember the whole story, but they remembered this verse. And so when they began to pay their pastor a salary, they literally paid him $80 a week because they said he's worth double honor. So if this, I'm not saying that when we have a pastor, like, you know, let's, what's the average salary in the church? Let's pay him double that. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying they took that literally. Now, it's easier to double it when it's $40, <laughs> you know, but I'm just saying. It, that, just an interesting thought when they, when they did that. Now, um, so that's elders. Now, also, you could look in Titus 1, where we just did, and, and 1 Peter 5. Uh, it says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory revealed. So that's one word. That's one aspect of it, it is an elder or someone who's mature in the faith, and able to express the word of God. Now, another one um, is a bishop or an overseer. Now, take your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This is a true saying, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. Hey, by the way, when Titus wrote to Paul and gave him the qualifications of what we would call a pastor, what did he call them? Elders. When he wrote to Timothy and gave him the qualification of the same position, what did he call them? Bishops, right? That word bishop is episkopos. It's where we get the word episcopal. Now, um, we don't call churches episcopal here in Australia. Um, it's, the, it's the Anglican church, the Church of England. Uh, but if you were in the United States, they do have the Church of England in the United States, but there's no way in the world, in the U.S., that they would ever attend anything called the Church of England. And you say, why? We kicked, they kicked them out a long time ago, right? Uh, they said, we're going to tax you and you're, you're not going to get any representation. So they said, get out. They said, we are not. They said, get out or we'll make you get out. And they did. And there you go. So what did they do with the church? They changed the name to the Episcopalian Church, the Episcopal Church. So that's, if you look at, if you hear it, the denomination of the Episcopalian, that is basically the same thing as what we would call Anglican. All right, but that's a word that we get, a bishop, which means to provide care for or oversight. All right, and we see that in 1 Timothy. If you desire the office of a bishop, you desire a good thing. And then also look at Philippians Chapter 1, in verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Right? So he's writing a letter to the bishops and the deacons. By the way, did you know when we look, think of Philippi and we think of the book of Philippians, we think he's writing to a church. 
but he's writing to the, that local area, and there's not just one bishop, and there's not just one deacon, there's bishops and deacons. Yes? We get the idea there's plural. All right, now, there's another one, the one that you're probably familiar with. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 13. Is that, they may have that reference wrong. Yep. I do. I got the wrong reference. Hmm. That's interesting. Wrote the wrong one down. I'll have to find the right one and let you know what it is. But he used the word pastors. All right. Uh, and that comes from a word that literally means that's where we get the word shepherd from. So really, when you call someone pastor, you know what you're really calling them? Shepherd. Verse 11. Thank you. And he, yeah, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. All right? And so literally, that word literally is shepherd. In other words, it means to care for the needs of others. So you get this idea. An elder is someone who knows the word of God and is mature and able to teach it to others. You get a, a bishop who is an overseer or, or administrator who kind of makes sure things go right and works right and is done, in, you know, the Bible says things to be done decently and in order, you know, that type of thing. And then we get the, the idea of a pastor who is like a shepherd who tends and cares for the needs and helps people, because that's what a shepherd does with a sheep, right? I haven't preached it in a long time. Um, but you know how there's the analogy in the Word of God where Christ is the shepherd and we are the sheep? Yeah. Well, if you do a real shepherding scene, there's only one other object left to represent a pastor. The sheep dog. <laughs> It's not real flattering, but, you know, that's kind of, eh, we'll, we'll go into that. That's not the message. That's a completely different thought for another time. All right, so, and then the fourth word that we, we find here is in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And verse 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So that, that word there, that rule over you, in other words, rule or a ruler, it means someone who rules or governs and, and affairs. And so we see a fourfold kind of if you look at, a, at the position, it's like a, a square, and each way you look at it, it's a different attribute. By the way, it's a title that all the same office, whether you want elders, whether they're bishops, whether they're pastors, whether they're rulers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, these four words are used interchangeably in the, in, in the New Testament, but there are subtle differences. An elder stress, stresses high qualifications for the office. And it comes, really, the idea of an elder comes out of the Old Testament. An overseer is, is a Greek idea of responsibility of the office of the elder. Okay? Uh, notice that, that word elders is always plural. It's always plural. Every time you see the word elder in the New Testament, it's always plural. You say, Why? One of the things the New Testament seems to teach is that a healthy church has more than one elder. It's not just one. All right? So what are the responsibilities of an elder within the context of, of church leadership? The Word of God really gives us several of these, and, and we'll look at them. The first one is an elder sets the example for Christian maturity. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. One Peter chapter 5, verse 3. Neither is being lords 
over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Right? So, sets an example of what does it look like to follow Christ? What does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to be a disciple? Right? Then if you go to 1 Peter chapter 5, still in verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So, another mark or another responsibility is to care for the flock that's under them. The, the church, the, the group of people that God's made them the under-shepherd. Because there's really only one shepherd, the chief shepherd, the under-shepherd. You know, an interesting verse to consider when you, when you look at the role of an elder, and I don't know if you would, this verse would immediately come to mind, but look with me at Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel 38 and verse 4. It says, And I will turn them back and put hooks into thy jaw, and I will bring thee forth and all thine enemies and horses and all of them clothed and all sorts of... That, again, that's not the verse I was looking for. Uh, I'll, have to f I'll look up that verse. I had a verse in mind, and it just completely wrote the wrong one down. I'll give it to you next week, all right? But it basically gave the idea this, of this, is to strengthen the weak, to heal the sick, to bind up the injured, to bring back strays, and to search for the lost. I hate when you're typing a verse and you flip verses around, and I'll get it for you. No, I'll get it for you, all right? Now, another one is to feed the flock through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. The responsibility of preaching is limited. Now, please don't take this wrong. All right? If you notice, a lot of times we're going to get into this, an elder should be a male, and the, the job of preaching is limited to the men. Uh, so you'll see in Scripture, we'll always say that the elder is male. It'll always be in the masculine. Now, that's not saying that, you know, ladies can't teach and ladies uh, can't be leaders and uh, there are roles and responsibilities that are assigned to, to the men in the church, right? And by the way, role does not equal worth, right? Everyone's worth the same in the body of Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor female, but he gives different roles, all right? A fourth job is to protect the sound doctrine of the church and drive away false teachers. All right? Titus chapter 1, where we, where we were. In verse 9, it says, Holding fast the faithful words as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You know, so, so if someone's going to fill the role, they should be able to understand and, and teach sound doctrine, but then... I don't know if you know it or not, but every now and then at church, there comes someone who has some false doctrine who wants to get in and wants to kind of push an agenda. And every now and then, you, you know, I have, I've said this a few times. To, you know, say, this, this doesn't sound kind. I'm sorry if it doesn't sound kind, but it really, uh, it's, it's, I've said to some people who, who came and, you know, started pushing different doctrines, different belief systems or different things. I looked at them and I said, you know what? I really don't think New Beginnings is a church for you. There might be a better church out there for you. Matter of fact, I could recommend you to a few where you might fit in a bit better. You say, you did not. I did. I did. You say, why? Protect sound doctrine. Hey, you don't need all the weird stuff out there going on. If you knew half the stuff that's going on out there and the weird beliefs out there, you'd be scratching your head going, what in the world? What are they thinking? What is going on? What's wrong with people? Hey, one of the roles of this, this, this elder is to protect the sound doctrine of the church and to drive away uh, false teachers. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 5. Uh, 
uh, verse 4 says, uh, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? One of that, that, that taking care of is, you know what? We should, we should be moving forward, not backwards. Isn't that, I mean, wouldn't you, if, if someone was you know, in your home, wouldn't you want your home to be going forward, not backwards? Well, same thing in the church. One of the things is to lead us forward. And you know, where do we go from here? And how do we, how do we get to the next step? And, and what do we do? And you know, every now and then, it's good to have reminders of, well, how do we share the gospel with people? Well, here's how we do it. Here's how we go forward. Or how do we do this? Here's how we go forward. Why do you, and, and people say, well, why, why do you have a vision Sunday? Well, because it tells us where we're going forward and how we're going to get there, right? And puts us all on the same page and gives us this goal to shoot for and, and helps us all work together and come together and do those types of things. Another thing, look at James chapter 5 and verse 14. If there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. You say, but we're in a Bible-believing independent Baptist church. We don't anoint with oil. We don't. You can. Now, I'm not saying that the elders praying over anointing with oil is going to be, that's a healing thing. But what does the Word of God say? One of the responsibilities of the elders is pray for the sick. Okay? Let's pray for the sick. That's okay. I can, I'll, I'll never forget when, years and years ago when, when I was in about fourth grade, I got frostbite in my hands. You wouldn't know what frostbite is here. You say it was cold this morning in church. You ain't seen nothing yet, all right? Uh, when I was, doing a, I was doing a newspaper route and I, I had thick gloves on and it was like negative degrees out in Fahrenheit. So it was really negative degrees in, in Celsius and, and I was out there and doing the paper out, flicking the papers, you know, doing that type of thing. And, and frostbite is when your hands get so cold, they're basically freeze. And the bad thing is, you don't know it until you got it. Because you go along and you think, oh, it's not that cold. I'll just keep going. And then why it doesn't seem it's that cold to your hands is you can no longer feel them. Okay, they're numb. And you don't realize what took place so you go back inside and you take the glove off and that numb hand meets heat. Then you experience tremendous pain. And so I got that and I got a real neurological disease and I was literally in a wheelchair for a good part of my middle school years and, and into high school and went through about 50 some odd different surgical procedures and nerve blocks and spinal taps and all sorts of things. And then uh, one day I was going for a surgery. It was my, I believe, I used to keep a, I used to have a notebook, you know, a, a tick tally score. And it said surgeries and I had a tick tally score. And I, I, if I remember right, it was tick tally number 50. And um, I remember sitting in church and I remember saying, I remember just going, Pastor, I don't know why I haven't thought of this before. And he was talking, he always came by and talked to me in my wheelchair. And I said, I don't know why I haven't thought of this before. He goes, what's that? I said, I was reading my Bible today, and it said to go to the elders and ask them to pray. And he goes, you know what? I prayed for you often, but we've never prayed for you in church. And so what do they do? That night, they wheeled me up. They lifted up the wheelchair. They put it on the platform. I was shocked. I didn't know what was about to happen. He opened the podium, had a little door in it, and he opened the door and he pulled out oil, like anointing oil. And he said, we're going to, he said to the church, he called the elders up, all the pastoral staff came up, all the deacons came up. He said, we're going to pray over him like, like in James chapter 5. And I thought, I just asked you to pray for me. I wasn't expecting to be up on the platform. I wasn't expecting to be in front of everybody. And I wasn't expecting to have the mob you know, if you know me, I don't like touching. You figure that one out? Can you imagine five deacons, three, three or four pastoral staff members, all with hands on me? And I already had pain issues. So I'm sitting there. They all do that. 
the, my pastor then, all of a sudden, is, you know, we're all praying. Next thing you know, I feel this wet, slimy thing on my forehead. I'm like, what did he do to me? And you kind of crack your eye and you go, oh, that's oil. And he prayed. Did what the Bible said. Say, what happened? Here's the weird thing. Can you say this is for sure what happened? I, I, all I know is that next morning, I went in for procedure number 50. And I've been in remission ever since. Like, I, I, like, and by the way, like, what was weird, my doctors couldn't explain this. They went in, they did the nerve block, they came back out. My doctor did the dumb thing he did to me every single time. He thought he was a comedian. If you've ever had a nerve block, you lose use of your arm. It's completely numb. So if someone were to hold your arm up in the air and say, try to keep it up, you are going to slap yourself in the face and there's nothing you can do about it. There's not a thing in the world you can do about it. You're, you're not going to stop it. It just, it, it's the arm's dead. And he, again, I said, no, you're not going to, are you? He's like, well, I got to see if it took. And he lifts my arm in the air and he says, now try to hold it up. I'm like, oh, great. Smack myself in the head again. He puts down, yep, I did a good job. I'm like, thanks. You know? But all of a sudden, as that began to wear off, I had no pain. And here's the other thing, when you know God does something, because usually, if you've been in a wheelchair for a length of time, you then have to do a lot of physical therapy to be able to learn to walk again. And here's what happened. All of a sudden, I said to my, my doctor, <laughs> I said, I can walk, and I can run, and I don't have any pain. And he goes, yes. I said, in two weeks is the first middle school basketball game for my Christian school's team. Can I play? And he said, I don't know how advisable it is. I said, I didn't ask if it was advisable. I asked, can I play? Like, if I can keep up and if I can run and if I can dribble a basketball and they'll let me play, can you sign a letter saying I can play? And he goes, sure. Here you go. Two weeks after going to remission, I played in the game. Now, I'm not telling you I did anything great. I, I was just happy to be out there. And, if, and then one day, one of my doctors came to the game, and there was a loose ball, and he saw me running, and he yelled out, no! Because he knew what I was about to do. I was leaping to save the ball, sidearm it back in, and go face first, arm first, into the wall. And when I did that, everyone that was there that was in my church, you just heard, <gasps> and then I popped back up and kept running, and they were like, Whew. You say, well, why do you say all that? Well, part of the job of, of a pastor, of an elder, is to pray for the sick. Now, I'm not, hey, after that, I went to my pastor, and I said, you know what, maybe you should, maybe we should have done this thing earlier. Maybe that's, yeah, I don't know. Maybe just God's timing. I, I, I can't explain it to you. And if you're still to go to the, my doctor today, technically, you know what they would tell you? The disease that I have is not curable. But if you've been in remission for more than two years, they consider you cured. So I'm cured from an uncurable disease that no one can explain. But why? Right. Pray for the elders. Pray for the sick. Those are six things that, that an elder should do. Now, as you think about that, I'm about to ask a question, but that one's going to be a long one to answer, so probably stop there. But I just want you to get in your mind this idea of, of an elder, of a pastor, of, of a bishop, of a ruler, and kind of reacclimate our mind to, really, what are the responsibilities? What does the Bible teach about them? We've seen that these, these six things, for sure, that Scripture says this is what they do, and this is some things. Now, we're going to, next week... I'm going to open a little bit of a can of worms. You say what? Um, why don't Baptist, Baptist churches have elders? You want an answer? You want to know the history? Come back next Sunday night. And we'll jump into that. And then we'll, then we'll get into all those different qualifications that the book of Titus lists. And 
Uh, just trying to get our thinking wrapped around this concept of an elder. You say, why? Because it was so important that Paul would send Titus places and say, set in order elders, then I would think that God would still want us to set in order elders. And before we can set them in order, we've got to know what they are to set them, don't we? You can't set something in order that you don't know what it is. And so hopefully we can continue learning uh, these things and, and looking at how we can apply that in, in our lives and in our church uh, in the coming times and in the future. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the, your word. We thank you so much for the book of Titus and the, the challenging things as we begin to learn and dig into this book. And Lord, we thank you for your, your word and the, the care that you give for us. And Lord, the way that you um, express how a church should operate and and uh, Lord, the roles that should be there and the roles and how they should function and work. And uh, Lord, I know that we, we work with imperfect people. We work with uh, people who are sinners. And Lord, we just thank you that you can still use us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The last song we'll be singing tonight is I Gave My Life for Thee. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth verses tonight. given for me my father's house of light my glory circled throne I left for earthly night for wandering sad and lone I left I left it all for thee what has the Lord for me I left I left it all for thee hast thou God for me, and I have brought to thee he down from my home above, salvation full and free, my pardon and my love. I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee, what hast thou brought for me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee, what hast thou brought to me? All right, once again, thank you for coming out this evening. We look forward to seeing you back on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, is our prayer meeting and Bible study. Still, that's still online, and we'll still have our prayer times and all of those things that we normally do. Uh, on the welcome table slash sign-up table, uh, there is still the single adults barbecue and, and teen barbecue to sign up for. Uh, we have, I think, including your family, I think we're up to about 26, 27-ish. And so if you still want to come, please come, sign up. And then there's also signing up for morning tea on the 23rd. And for those who want to help out on the 22nd uh, with Super Saturday. So a lot of things coming up to sign up for. We look forward to what... Our Lord's going to do in the coming weeks. And then also, I need to ask, if any of you have been throughout the year uh, snapping photos at church, taking photos of things, events at church, if you have any photos like that, if you could send them to me in some way, whether it's email, whether it's putting them in a Dropbox folder and emailing me a link to that folder, or whatever way you can get them to me on a, on a heart, USB or a thumb drive or a, hey, Emily, can we have a conversation? No. <laughs> Hopefully other people other than Emily have, have taken photos. You say, why? Uh, because for anniversary Sunday, you remember we try to do a, a highlight video of the last year in the life and ministry of New Beginnings Baptist Church. And uh, it's always fun to take a few moments and go back and look at some things. And, and this year, what I might do, eh, might throw in some even early photos. Um, and so that way you can see 
like the beginning stages and maybe the, if I find them the first photos of the first church service or you know, some of those things and see what God's done uh, throughout the last nine years in the life of our church. And I would look forward to that. So if you do have any photos, please get them to me uh, so that way I can use them. And uh, preferably, if I have to be more specific, can they preferably be landscape photos and not portrait photos? You say, why? Landscape photos fill the screen better. Portrait photos leave a lot of weird gray area. Uh, but we'll take those two if they're good, all right? So uh, if you could help me out with that, that'd be wonderful. All right, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And uh, then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for this time together in your word. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to lead and guide us this week. Help us to be witness for you and uh, bring us back again safely. And the next time we come together, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.